Your connection to our treasured Catholic faith all day, every day. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network, radio for your soul. my Jesus, forgive us of our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who most need thy mercy. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Dominic the Guzman, pray for us. And Venerable Father Augustus Tolton, pray for us. I found today's gospel reading at Mass today so relevant to the times that we're in right now. And if you didn't go to Mass this morning, if you didn't do your readings, um, I'll, I'll read it for you now. So today's reading at Mass, it comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And it says that Jesus summoned the 12 and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. And he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to give a vaccine to the sick. He said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither walking stick, nor sack, nor food, nor money, and let no one take a second tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. And for those who do not welcome you, when you leave that town, shake the dust from your feet in testimony against them. They then sent out, they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and mandating vaccines everywhere. Not before, not long before that. And, and also in Luke chapter eight, verses 18, it reads, when the son of man returns, will he find faith on earth? An amazing verse. I mean, those verses in scripture talking about how the apostles would just go around and and mandate vaccines for everyone was, oh man, I mean, it's really just, it, it really fits into our times now, right? It, it's amazing how nothing has changed over the last 2000 years. Jesus was not healing people 2000 years ago. He was just mandating vaccines. So were the apostles. It's, it's I, I tell you, I mean, the word of God, that's all sarcasm, by the way, but take what I said and think about it. Because because I really don't think that we, we truly appreciate, that really truly appreciate the time that we're living in right now, right? I mean, we, we've had clues, right, of it for a while that this is a faithless generation. We've had the evidence of the high abortion rates, which is the, the highest, I think, expression of a people not depending on God. We, we've had the evidence of the larger growing religious group being non-religious, the evidence of the lack of belief <clears throat> in the Holy Eucharist. Uh, and now we're being told that the Sea of Rome, the Sea of Rome, the seats of Peter, the Vatican, the resting place of Peter and Paul, Peter, whom the church is built, that that, that church, the Vatican State, will no longer allow the sick in. Will no longer allow the sick into the Vatican. For right now, those who are, are suffering from, and by sick, I mean those who are suffering from what's called the acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, will no longer be allowed to enter the Vatican state. To enter the Vatican State now, you need a vaccine passport, a negative test, uh, proof of vaccination. And in some limited cases, some clergy may enter, some clergy may enter without any of those documents or proofs, but will have to leave the Vatican State immediately after their service to the Mass has been rendered. Again, those apostles who Jesus gave the authority to heal the sick will no longer allow the sick into their presence. The Vatican State, which should be on par with places like Lourdes, the Shrine of Our Lady Guadalupe, and Medjugorje, as a, as a place where people pilgrimage to, 
to seek supernatural healing, but has never really been throughout the course of history. The Vatican has never really been in that place. Uh, oddly enough, now you, you think it should be, but that place has affirmed to the world that they are without faith. This news and the news of other Catholic dioceses requiring the, vac the vaccine for Catholics to have access to the sacraments should not only alarm you, right? The fact that our institutional Catholic church has, has, has seemed to devolve back into being a, a state church who, who does the bidding of governments is it, not only sad, but it's pathetic. I mean, who wants a worldly church, a church that points to human effort rather than supernatural grace? This news should also create in you a sense of urgency of the hour that we're in. Pray for spiritual, the spiritual health of our church and for our clergy. A few weeks ago, I had a show, um, the David L. Gray Show here. You listen to on Guadalupe Radio Network, David L. Gray Show, voicing truth and reason on the Guadalupe Radio Network, which is radio for your soul. So a few weeks ago, I had a, a show on here about where I was talking about whether Freemasonry is still a threat in the world today. And I had a guest on to talk about that, but we never really got a chance to talk about that. All right, the show kind of went into like a different direction that I really didn't anticipate. So I thought I might revisit that topic today in a framework offering like a brief overview of the visible enemies of Christ and his church over the past 500 years in their efforts. Right. And the second half of the show, starting about the 20 minute mark, Timothy J. Gordon will be back on the David O. Gray show. He is the author of the uh, upcoming book, The Case for Patrimony. And he'll be on here to talk about some current events. So looking forward to hear from um, Timothy J. Gordon again. So, but first, let me tell you how happy I am that you tuned in this afternoon. And I pray that you know that Jesus truly does love you. He is truly there for you. And he wants you to invite him into every aspect of your life, every aspect, especially those parts where you don't think you need him, right? Those parts where you think you may, you know, you rely on yourself, you trust on yourself or you, you trust in human efforts, right? Um, you think that's enough, but you know, God wants to be in all those, all the parts of our life. He wants to be all up in our life. So we have to invite him and pray that Jesus truly does enter every aspect of our life and every decision that we're making. Lord, please guide me. Right. My producer, Miss Cecil Anderson, you can see her on also, you can see Cecil, you know, if you call in to the show, you get to talk to Cecil, but you can also see her on the Guadalupe Radio Network show. Back to the Father, which streams on our streaming channels, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, on Friday afternoons. Dave Palmer, he's the general manager from the Dallas Fort Worth station. If you're tuning in to our share last week, and, and God bless those of you who did contribute some of your gifts. Um, Dave, you know, he, you hear him, you, you know, you would heard him there. He also sometimes do other programs on the show. And, but yeah, he's a general manager. Yeah. So back to the father's really good show is Thomistic. It's talking about how the, the theology of Thomas Aquinas applies today. So really good discussions. So if you want to call in Opine, like I said, uh, you can call when Timothy is here and the number is 877-757-9424. That's 877-757-9424. And Cecil will get you on. And make sure you start every morning listening to the Catholic Drive Time Show here on Guadalupe Radio Network with Joe McLean, Adrian Francesca, and Janice Valenzuela. And like I said, that's on starting about 6 a.m., starting at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time. One thing I like about the Guadalupe Radio Network show, one of the things I think is the, is the best morning show in, in Catholic radio because it's always consistent. It's always faithful. It's always true, right? It doesn't play with the dogma. And it's never – Joe, Adrian, and Janice, they're not what I call Catholic butts, right? Catholic butts are people who say, I'm Catholic. But, you know, I, I kind of believe this or that about abortion or I'm Catholic, but, you know, it's no, they're not Catholic, butts. they're not. So they're, they're, they're always solid and true. So make that your morning time listening as you get going. You know, you know, the phrase, the big lie, and I think you've heard this a lot. It's become a, a catchphrase in the liberal media really to consolidate people's um, Sonny, any question people might have about the 2020 presidential election, right? The big lie, 
right? It, it's a term that is used to have us avoid and dismiss the work of any critical thinking or even uh, suspiciously, uh, think suspiciously about the, the, the litany of events and anomalies that should give cause uh, in critical to any critical thinking person to question how that happened, right? Or, or who made that call for that to happen? And, and really not to delabor the point here, right? Because we're going to Freemasonry and communism and, you know, the big tech um, governance here in, in a moment, but not, not to delabor the point. I think I should really talk about this a little bit more since I set it up, right? With the, with the, the, the big lie that's going on. What the big lie is that the media is talking about the big lie, right? The big lie is this. I could get this in the form of examples when we talk about the 2020 election. In the five prior presidential elections, four of them had total vote ranges from about 122 million to about 130 million. But the last election had over 155 million people voting. Okay, fine. We can say that's, oh, well, a lot more people came out, a lot more absentee ballots. Fine, we should dig into that. But the big lie is that we can't even question it, that we should just accept the fact that over 25 million more people voted, right? Despite the fact that the population of our country did not grow that fast, right? There are not just 25 million more 18 year olds, okay? But we can't question it. The question that is the big lie. Questioning how President Trump received almost 11 million more votes in 2020 than he got in 2016, improving his national performance, more black people voting for him, more Hispanics voting for him. I mean, just, just performing, his, just overperforming than what he did in 2016, yet still lost by 6 million votes to a candidate who didn't have one rally, barely left his basement, and, and could barely speak when reading the teleprompter, right? We can't question that. We can't question how Trump got way more votes and nearly doubled his, his, his black male vote, yet still lost. That's a big lie, right? We can't question it. We can't question how Donald Trump lost despite winning 80% of all counties across the nation, including 19, including 18 of the 19, all but one bellwether counties that he needed to capture in a key battleground key battleground states. Now, keep in mind, those 19 bellwether states of which Trump won, won 18 of them had correctly picked the president over the last 10 election cycles. And no Republican has ever won, or well, since Nixon has never won both Florida and Ohio and lost. And that's strange, right? Almost two generations of, uh, we have anomalies that haven't been a case in two generations, but to question that is to resurrect the big lie, right? Another anomaly being belonging to the big lie is that you, you is trying to understand how were Republicans able to do so well down ballot in house seats, but lost the presidency. Again, that's something that almost never happens, but to question it is the big lie. And we haven't even gotten in talking about the anomalies on a state level that only occurred in those five battleground states. And this thing about this um, nomenclature called the big lie is that it's a lie itself. And as the nature of a lie is that lies all lead to death. And it's the case. We now have a presidency that has done nothing over the last nine months, but attack life, attack truth, attack Christ in the church. But the Biden anomaly presidency is the least of the lies that have occurred over the past 500 years. I would say the first big lie came to us in 1517 under the name of the Protestant movement or the Protestant reform, uh, reformulation as I like to call it, reforming the dogma. It was a movement against the Catholic church, which was instigated by Martin Luther and the German princes who used him to break free from the influence of the Roman pontiff and all that came with that. Right? And it wasn't Martin Luther's ideas of scripture alone or grace alone or his editing of the Bible to fit his twisted narrative or him teaching that polygamy was fine or that Jews should be killed. That was his biggest lies. No, rather, it was his teaching on the human nature itself, which really was the first thing that 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 struck directly at what Catholics know to be true. 
that as Catholics, we believe that we're redeemed from the inside out, that that baptism, that through baptism, we're born again, born anew in Christ and we receive enlightenment. Luther taught the opposite. He was teaching that the sacrament of baptism has no regenerative effect. That baptism and all the other sacraments are just, they're not efficacious. They're not supernatural. They're just mere external signs. The sacraments are really no better than placing a pile of snow to cover a pile of horse crap, hiding what lies underneath the snow, hiding the smell. The demonic teaching that, that we are no better than, than, than for having truly encountered Jesus Christ is the lie from 1517 that will harm innocent souls for the next 500 years and a lie that will continue to attack Christ and his church and what God has revealed to her. So that's Protestantism. That's the big lie from 500 years ago. To this day, Protestantism and her lies continue to stay with us because lies and will always be with us you know, until our Lord returns. But Protestantism would be seceded with another big lie. This lie came in 1717, 200 years later. Whereas the central Protestant teaching was that your fallen nature is not able to be regenerated the teachings from the Freemasons, whose new Grand Lodge system and former degree system 200 years later in England in 1717, is not that, is it, is, is not that Christ and his church unites all men. It's not, it's not Christ and his church that unites us. But rather, it is naturalism and the rejection of the lower thoughts they call divine religion. The rejection of supernatural religion is what unites all men under the common brotherhood of Freemasonry. Freemasonry, therefore, now becomes the center of union for all men to agree. And, that, and that's verbatim what is written in the Constitution of the Mother Grand Lodge of England in 1723, six years after the birth of Freemasonry, the Grand Lodge system in 1717. While the big lie of Protestantism sought to divide the people of God, Freemasonry comes along to unite them into herself. And like Protestantism, the main adversary and target for their attacks and lies would be the Catholic Church. Now, but now the big problem with Freemasonry is that well, while it's filled, it's filled uh, with people in governments and states around the world, its weakness was that it was not a government entity itself. It was not a government entity itself that could directly govern. That's its weakness. It could only influence government through people. So the big lie of Freemasonry will remain with us, as all lies do. But 200 years later, in 1917, it was seceded. It was seceded by the next big lie called communism. Whereas Freemasonry is a social, fraternal, syncretive religious idea, yet unable to govern, communism is a political ide ideology of a, a type of government in which the state owns major resources, society, including property, means of production, education, agriculture, transportation, and so on and so forth. They own everything you need. So basically, communism proposes a society in which there are two classes of people. There's the elite who govern and the workers who are controlled by the elite to provide for the working class. Food, shelter, clothing, in some measure, safety. So the elite governing class have one set of rules and one set of wealth, while the wealth created by the working class, while the working class, you know, they share the benefits of their, their labor, right? Portions of it. As a vision by Karl Marx, communism was really to be a global way of governance to control people and resources for the elites by the elites. Communism spreads through social unrest and capitalism through revolution, revolts. And we say that began taking place in Europe around 1840 or 1848. There's a springtime revolution. They call it a springtime of peoples. And in 1917, communism was adopted in Russia after the Russian Revolution. And just as we saw Protestantism and Freemasonry, now with communism, wherever it spreads, the church and her priests and people are persecuted and many die. And like Catholics were banned from Freemasonry in 1738, so too were Catholics forbidden from professing communist doctrine. And that happened in 1949. These prohibitions against Freemasonry and communism remain in place. Now the most recent big lie. I'm going to get to this one. I'm going to bring Mr. Timothy J. Gordon on. We're going to talk about some current events and um, his book that's releasing in just, man, a few days. Um, the Case for Patriarchy. 
But the big lie, it wraps up here. So we talked about the first big lie of the last 500 years, Protestantism, succeeded by Freemasonry, Freemasonry succeeded by communism. After the presidential election in 2016, which put Donald Trump in place as the visible governor of the free world, a person who seemed to be not controlled or in league with the globalists or enemies of Christ and his church. What we saw in 2017 in response to that was the rise of big tech governance, which unlike Protestantism, the Protestant wave in 1517 was not mired down in religious dogma that was incompatible with a growing post-Christian society, not encumbered with the Gnosticism and fraternalism and threatening secrecy of Freemasonry. Now, now to be sure, of course, Algorithms are secret and threatening and Gnostic, but they appear to be helpful, right? Unlike Freemason. Also, not encumbered with the deadly and dark history of communism, big tech governance, which like Freemasonry in many ways, because it moves in and out of every country, is free in that way. It's like Protestantism, because it's indifferent to divine truth and not concerned with, with the truth of our nature, of who we were created by and for. And also like communism, because it attempts to govern globally by being a source of what they have convinced us we need. Big tech governance not only controls information that it tells us we need, but it collects all the data about our lives and then uses it to control us. Big tech governance tells us what we need to like, share, what we need to invest, divest, what we should believe, not believe, and what we should think is a big lie. Big tech governance controls who's elected and suppresses any dissent about who it elects. Big tech governance cooperates with nations by, by governance giving them data about their citizens. And like all of his predecessors, big tech attacks the Catholic Church by propping up values of the culture of death and controlling information about the masses that it, uh, it provides, uh, it, it provides being a provider and source, right? That we need it, right? Yet it silences those who doesn't go along with the program. So when I'm asked by people, you know, when I'm often asked, you know, David, is, is Freemasonry still a big concern today? Is it still as dangerous as it was in 1717, in 1738? I answer that question like by saying, you know, like any lie, Freemasonry is still problematic. I mean, it's a philosophy that still leads souls to hell. It still it should still be banned by the Catholic Church. But as a means of global governance, no, Freemasonry has long been supplanted at least two times by now, first by communism and then by big tech governance. And big tech governance, I think, is really the most dangerous of all that has come before because it perfectly blends everything that is most dangerous about all of its predecessors. But it does one thing that none of them could do. It knows everything about us. It has the data. This is an all-knowing aspect, an all-seeing eye aspect of the big tech that makes it very powerful and able to control many people on a temporal level. It is the most dangerous foe. And the only way to fight it is to be holy and to not give it any hold over us, to be free from it, not depend on it, which means that our faith and trust have to be in God, not in the things of the world, in the things that it mandates. And that's all I know about that. This is the David L. Gray Show, voicing truth and reason on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Right after the break, Timothy J. Gordon will be on the show to explain to us uh, what is the patriarchy, why his book is something we definitely should read. And I'll talk a little bit about current events, too. So stay tuned for that. This is the David O. Gray Show, voicing truth and reason on the Guadalupe Radio Network. This is your Catholic radio station, and we'd like to make it even better for you. Your feedback is really important to us. Just go to our website, grnonline.com, and look for the button labeled 60-second radio survey. It only takes a minute to fill out and send to us. Again, go to our website, grnonline.com, and look for the button labeled 60-second radio survey. We'd really appreciate it. Do you know any Lord of the Rings fans? And unless there is much amiss in Rohan, and the power of Saruman is greatly increased, 
They will take the shortest way that they can find over the fields of the Rohirrim. You could possibly win one of four free audiobook downloads narrated by Andy Serkis. All you need to do is tune in to Catholic Drive Time on Thursday morning and be on our email list at grnonline.com forward slash cdt. God love you. Did you know that we are praying for you and your needs? Every Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Central Time, the employees of the Guadalupe Radio Network join in a conference call to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet for you. We have offices and employees in seven different locations. So this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to come together for one of the most important activities of our day, prayer. Before we start the Divine Mercy Chaplet, we always lift up the intentions of all of our listeners and benefactors, both current and past. We also lift up any specific prayer intentions that have been called in or emailed to one of our seven different offices. Prayer has always been a foundational part of the GRN's existence. Coming together to pray the Divine Mercy helps us remember that prayer has enabled us to accomplish what we have. Hi, this is Len Oswald, President of the Guadalupe Radio Network. We are your Catholic radio station. Radio for your soul. Welcome back in to the David O. Gray Show, voicing truth and reason on the Guadalupe Radio Network, which is radio for your soul. Timothy J. Gordon is back on the David L. Gray Show. He was here a few weeks ago talking about his upcoming book, Case for Patriarchy, which is being published by Sophia Press Institute. That is Sophia Press Institute. Recommend that you go over there and buy it. Of course, you, you know, if you like going to other places, Amazon, your local bookstore, get it there. If you're a member of my Patreon team at a certain level, you get this book for free in October. So this is my book of the month for October. It is Case for Patriarchy by Timothy J. Gordon. I like this book, definitely recommend it. So that's why I'm making it my book of the month. To find out more about the Catholic philosopher, sometimes with a skateboard, Visit Timothy at timothyjgordon.com and also check out all of his books and his retrograde classical academy at timothyjgordon.com. Welcome on to the David O. Gray Show, Timothy. Thanks so much, David. Great to be with you, brother. Yeah, pleasure. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm waiting to get my copy of The Case for Patriarchy in the Mail today. Oh, a lot wow. of people are getting it before I am. Which you is know, that... You. that that happens, you know, as a publisher myself, I, yeah, I, I think we can treat authors a little more. I mean, it's your book. You should definitely get the first copies, right? I mean, that's, you would think, but you didn't pay for yours. Think. And so that how yeah. that, that's how that works. I know what I said though. So I, it's <laughs> part of the people are getting the message, the most revolutionary or counter revolutionary message of 2021 is the case for patriarchy it's it's the book so i'd rather people have it in their hands i i remember what i said i can i can recapitulate <laughs> yeah how are you excited because i know i know what it feels like you know like the weeks before the days before your, your book come, comes out it's like a lot of anticipation a lot of nerves how's my book going to be received by the masses is the masses going to get it and like what's what's some of your thoughts right now i mean you you've already published rules for retrogrades you have a book before that but how how does this one feel this one feels a little different because I mean, everything you said, the way you characterized having a book come out is, is it's just a tremendous amount of work. I think it was Tom Woods that was telling his supporters, don't boycott book boycotts, you know, don't organize book by boycotts against even our enemies, because you know what? It's so much effort and blood and sweat and tears that go into the writing of the book that it's just cruel. So you're always wondering you know, what's going to be the popular reception of this book? You can't let it affect the way that you write the book because you don't want to write the book right. in such a way that, that right. uh, is seeking to throw chum in the water or anything like that. But with this particular book, it's my third outing after Catholic Republic and then Rules for Retrogrades. The case for patriarchy, I expect more from in terms of the wideness of the readership because it's true at the level of all three major types of Christian that, you know, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Protestants alike have at the very least scripture. And scripture is so crystal clear about the fact that Christianity invokes a bifurcated patriarchy. There's a clerical one, 
you know, all male presbyterate and episcopate. Now the Protestants balk at that a bit, but the the second half of it, the lower half of it, the lay patriarchy, David, mm-hmm. is accepted by all Bible knowing Christians of all three stripes, and so it was a fun chance to be ecumenical, which is not something that anyone out there expects of me. I, I'm not an ecumenical lad <laughs> by temperament or by credo. And, uh, and so I, I could just, I could preach to all Christians. Now I do, there is in my rantings in this book, it's, it's mainly just research. There's yeah. a lot of Catholic specific stuff like the patristic writers, Jerome, mm-hmm. Augustine, Ambrose, St. John Chrysostom, the first interpreters of scripture are even more based and red pilled than St. Paul is on the household lay patriarchy. You know, yeah. wives must obey their husbands. What does this mean? I'm sure we'll talk about that some, but the, the first Christian interpreters who are all Catholics, mm-hmm. they're even more out there than me. Even I was almost scandalized by some of the ways that they're <laughs> unpacking the requirements of the lay Christian patriarchy. Yeah. Yeah. So when we say, you know, we always ask authors, you know, well, who did you write this book for? So I'm hearing that you wrote this book for everyone. But did you write this book for women? Do women get anything out of this book? Oh, yes. Yes. So many of our friends and friends of friends got early copies of the PDF and it helped them. And because, I mean, I, I was only kidding when I said that the book had anything to do with my rantings. It was all just research. And as awake as i i've been on this issue since i did that now famous some say infamous matt frad interview of two summers ago on feminism when i was beginning to write the book i learned Mm. a lot even in a backloaded way even the when i was writing the last couple chapters Mm -hmm. when we had some publication shifts i had to write a couple more chapters and that's when i saw all of the patristic teachings on those seven passages in saint paul in the new testament which just leave the matter beyond any shadow of a doubt. There can't be any such thing as Christian feminism. I'll explain why I'm sure as we get to it. But yeah, I mean, if anything, sincere Christian wives, they're kind of the main um, group that gets love in this book because it's like, look, I understand that the church absolutely refuses to teach you on this. Not Mm -hmm. only does Ephesians 5, maybe the most noteworthy, uh, Pauline epistle on what are the roles of women, well, married women. Uh, not only is it actually censored in the missile, it's bracketed and censored. The, the church will not teach it in yeah. the modern era. Yeah. But these women are all literally writing me. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for writing this book. I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, uh, you know, one, one uh, lovely young woman dropped out of med school and she's like, wow, okay, I didn't know. The teaching is really crystal clear. Wow. The Roman Catechism says women should love to stay home and and almost never go out. And what does this mean? What are the requirements? Well, it's been talked about by like six popes and encyclicals in the 20th century. Tons of scriptural reference by St. Paul. And the church is univocally taught on it for 2,000 years. It's a falsehood to say that this was, you know, confined to the first, you know, thousand years of Christianity and the church abandoned it. No, they just won't talk about the fact that even five or six papal encyclicals recur to the idea there must be like one household income. Uh, Yeah. Talk about that for a moment, Timothy, from the ladies who've read it so far. Yeah. And talk about that, those two things. Uh, One respond to why is, why do we feel like as though we have to apologize for Ephesians five and, and with that add into why um, respond to that things like, verses that we read like in Ephesians 5 or the cyclicals that you're pointing to, that was just cultural. That was just a time in history. Uh, you know, it's just cultural, but we, we've moved on beyond that. Respond to both of those things. Yeah, excellent. First part of the question, David, thank you for that excellent question. Why do we feel we have to respond uh, and, and in a apologetic tones for Ephesians 5? Well, simple. It's because the modern cuckolded Christian feels he has to res- uh, respond in apology for Jesus, not in apologia, but in apology for Jesus. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church, which is female, is his bride. We respond nowadays. Look at Pope Francis for the idea that Jesus makes the rules and we have to follow them. 
Jesus laid down the Sermon on the Mount. We have to follow it. Jesus said no divorce, so we can't have divorce. Jesus said do X, so we have to do X. That is the entire approach of Francis' pontificate. And St. Paul explicitly likens uh, householding men, meaning a, a married Christian man, to Jesus and to Abraham in Ephesians 5. And that means that the church is like the bride. The, the bridegroom of Christ obeys him in all things, submission in all things, says mm -hmm. Ephesians 5. And wives have to uh, obey their husbands in all things aside from grave matter. So a husband can't um, command his wife to uh, contracept or stay home from mass or anything like that. But right. anything else, any prudential judgment, even a questionable prudential judgment, that is the universal three types of Christian, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, only standard, not gold standard. It's the only standard. So that's, that's as clear as day. The first Christian interpreters, which even the Protestants accept, Augustine, Ambrose, they're a little less high on Jerome, St. John Chrysostom, they say some amazing things in Ephesians 5, uh, about Ephesians 5, that are even more stark than what Paul says. But I, I would point out, it's not just Ephesians 5, it's 1 Corinthians, uh, it's, uh, 1 Corinthians Colossians, Timothy, Titus, um, there, there is some amazing stuff that is way more based in red pill than even Ephesians 5 directly yeah. said by St. Paul and directly treated of and unpacked by the first patristics. One of the things is comes directly from St. Paul. Woman is the glory of man. Man is the glory of God. That is inerrant scripture. And uh, in this sense, glory means the help made of, which is what all of these writers refer to a wife as this is the helpmate of the husband just as the husband is kind of the the lord's steward on earth so that that would be how i'd answer your second question like mm -hmm. you know depending on where you locate the call of the question precisely uh, women have been wholly misconceived intentionally it's part of the psyop it's part of the overarching freemasonic plan and when women realize, married women, realize the pure, obvious, unequivocal teaching of the church for 2,000 years on, oh, this is what a woman is to do. She is to love her husband. If a woman doesn't love her husband in the sense of fealty and submission, mm -hmm. then she is rejecting Christ. Just yeah. as if a, a man doesn't love his wife as Christ loved the church. Yeah. And he is failing to love Christ. But it's a very different kind of love. That's what complementarity yeah. is. It means yeah. we're not giving and getting the same things in return. Abraham did not call Sarai Lord. Sarah called Abraham Lord. And that's why this is referred to by St. Paul and all the patristics. Very clear stuff. Yeah. Just that. We're speaking with Timothy J. Gordon. You can find out more about him at his name, timothyjgordon.com. See all of his books, but the book we're speaking about now is the one that's being published by Sophia Press Institute, coming out on October first. So, really excited about this book. Like I said, if you um, are my Patreon member, you get this book for free. If you're a member of the book club, so I'm excited for you to get it. Tim, let's turn for a moment and just talk about uh, some things that's going on in culture right now, and see how it kind of fits in with what you're talking about in your book um there's I, i'll really just leave it to you I, you know i won't really set it up too much I, i'll just throw these topics out there for you um what's being called the border crisis you're in the south i um, don't know if you guys are really sp experiencing it there um but what's your thoughts on this thing that we're calling the border crisis well it's an interesting question i mean look but my one of the main things that I do on my podcast rules for retrogrades is I'm, I'm calling for a return to states rights, meaning, you know, the all in the original constitution, all of the sexy moral powers of legislation. Can we, can we legislate morality? This was a big like debate in the nineties. And, you know, you're kind of supposed to say no, if you're like a libertarian type conservative and, and, the left and then centrists would say, I guess, yes, because they like big government. The question is answered very clearly by the real 
Constitution that most people don't know. It, well, the U.S. Constitution reified an imperium in imperio, an empire within an empire, two sovereignties, state governments and the national government. And the answer is very clear. If you read Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, which says the scant, amoral, mechanistic, I'd say unsexy legislative fields that Congress is supposed to be making laws on, the National Congress, they're all boring things that, that literally bore them, like coining money or building post offices. They don't like that. They want to legislate morality, which is, by Amendment 10, explicitly left to the state governments, mm. the, the several state legislatures hold something called the police power, the power to regulate health, safety, welfare, morals, and security. And so the, the quite simple answer, the American answer that Pope Pius IX loved so much about America, Pope Pius XI extolled as uh, subsidiarity in America, even Pope Leo XIII loved it about America, is the idea that Subsidiarity dictates that you can legislate morality by more local spheres of government, which are more reactive to your actual needs. The central government should do basically immoral things like defend borders and build post roads and things like that. Well, so the question is, um, Texas is having to defend its sovereign borders. <laughs> the, the, the federal government has taken from it its legislative domain to do things like illegalize abortion, which is what we're hoping all 50 states do, right? The government right. has tried to take over that domain vis-a-vis -vis the 14th Amendment and tell Texas that they're not allowed to get rid of abortion. That's what Roe versus Wade stood for, which is the opposite of what the Fed's supposed to do. And simultaneously, they're not defending the southern border, which is the border of both the nation, America, and the state. And that's yeah. actually one of the few things that the central national government's supposed to do, and they're making Texas do it on their own. Yeah. So you, th that's my view on the, the uh, illegal immigration crisis, is the, the federal government refuses to do what it is supposed to be doing, and it is commandeering from the more sovereign, more holy, more moral state powers, the things they're supposed to be doing. It's kind of like the feminists. The feminists don't want to do what is their unique purview, their unique domain, birthing babies and, and being a helpmate and keeping homes beautified and lovely and, and um, charming and holy, being the heart of the home where the man is the head of them. They want to not do what they're supposed to do, and they're, supposed, they're trying to commandeer everything that is male. And, you know, they're much better, the ladies, at being ladies, just as men are better at being men. And so everyone's unhappy. And it's kind of what the federal government's doing to the states. Interesting. I like how you how you wrote that in. I mean, we we have a we have a long conversation about people acting outside of their purview of things that they've been called to do, and uh, <laughs> so many places we can go with that today. Yeah. But but staying with the the illegal immigration issue, and, and speaking about because we talked about manhood. And the call of a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. I always always looked at that as the woman being a type of church in a way. And of course, that, that means a lot of things for the man, how he lives his life in a sacrificial way. And it also means a lot about children, how they live their life in response to their mother's calling to being a, a type of a of a church in a way. But what's going on with these men? I mean, we just we just read there, I think, oh, man, about twenty three hundred right now, twenty three hundred families, Haitian families in, in Texas, which means there was a husband and a wife, maybe some children. I think two hundred thirty six are pregnant. What does that say about a man who. Does brings his wife to another country, crosses those dangerous waters and put his, his wife and his woman in danger like that? Am I, am I looking at this kind of weird? Is, is that. Is, is that what a man would do to put his wife in danger like that? Well, it's a I mean, that, I, I think I agree with you, David, but it's a prudential judgment call. Right. And, and I yeah, I think it's a bad prudential judgment call. Um, there's a saying in the law. B is less than PL by the famed judge learned hand. And B is the burden to change your behavior is less than the probability of some expected loss times the, the size of the loss itself if you can quantify all those terms. Hmm. And I always kind of use B as less than PL for big prudential decisions. I mean, 
if it's like that movie Greenland that, that came out at the end of the, you know, 2020 COVID year and the only way to survive at all is to get me, my wife and my kids to Greenland within 48 hours, <laughs> then yeah, I'm going to take risks associated with that because right. the, um, you know, the B, the B must overcome a certainly huge L with a certainly huge P that the probability yeah. is hundred percent. I'll die of a yeah. comet, yeah. a, a planet killing comet. But if it's, you know, if, if the, the countervailing danger of staying where you're at is a smaller P times L, well, then you ought to stay. Uh, but, but I, I mean, I'm sure I agree with you in terms of what, what you're saying about this is, this is a bad prudential call to expose your wife and kids to any extra dangers associated with needlessly moving. Yeah, right. And we're speaking with Timothy J. Gordon. I forgot to mention, if you want to call in and ask Tim a question about his book or any, you know, he's a Catholic philosopher, smart guy. He has a whole academy that you can learn more about on his website, Timothy J. Gordon's. You can call in 877-757-9424. Again, that's 877-757-9424. And I see some um, comments are coming in on the live stream. So I'll, I'll try to get to those where they are relevant. Sticking with um, people who make horrible prudential judgments. It seems like Joe Biden has a pattern <laughs> of leaving people behind. Remember with the whole Benghazi thing? Yeah. You know, we have people left behind there now in Afghanistan, leaving people, people behind comment on that in context of, of, you know, your, your book and what you're saying about manhood. Well, no man is supposed to be left behind. Right. I mean, that's, that's what uh, the Marines tell each other. And there's a sacred violation uh, involved by Benghazi. And I think it's more than just even what most people know. Uh, there's more than just a kind of violation of a sacred pact. There's a lot of lying and cover up involved in Benghazi. And, and you can you can learn about that if you, you dig around for just an hour or so. Hmm. And yeah, and that that is um, Biden's in that up to his neck. And now, you know, the the removal of troops after a 20, 20 year catastrophe in Afghanistan was done in the fashion you would expect from, you know, second in charge of Benghazi, which is to say irresponsibly in an un-American way, in a way that does not put uh, American lives first, which is sort of the sacred pact stood for the by the proposition of the u.s constitution as it relates to the military right look mm -hmm. u.s military is protecting american interests in a moral way you know we're, we're called to do that by god but um you know these these people were were sacrificed you know on, yeah. and, and they're left on the funeral pyre in afghanistan which is the boneyard of empires being there uh and yeah, there's a lot more we could say about that, but I, I think we agree 100 <laughs> percent from what yeah, you're yeah. saying. And, and looking at another, <clears throat> I think it's quite a reasonable response when we look at Afghanistan. Now we see who's in charge, you know, the Taliban loosely. I think I think I think there's a lot more local controls by other people depending upon, you know, the, the city. But Sharia law, right, and how it. I want you to comment on what you're saying in your book about the role of man, the role of wife. And I want you to comment on that in context of Sharia law, how they don't, a lot of them, the interpretation of it, women should not be educated. Women should pretty much stay home unless she needs to go out and get water. Contrast the Christian idea of manhood, womanhood, husband, wife versus what Sharia law is talking about. Well, I would first point out that um, the five times daily prayer that Muslims say is called the El Fatiha prayer, and it is the first eight surahs of the Quran, or first first eight verses of the first surah, rather. And the the uh, seventh verse basically calls down God's vengeance on all Christians. I would just say this is a prefatory word, because when I would run uh, a training for a marathon in Rome when I lived there. There are a lot of Muslims that hung out at the park that I ran at in between Santa Croce and Jerusalem and, and uh, San Giovanni. And uh, I always thought they would give me an awkward eye, a funny, funny eye. Um, and I looked up what they were praying five times a day, and it was calling down 
judge God's judgment on me. And, you know, the, the frame of mind that that puts one in to do five times a day is, is a serious issue. Now, uh, Sharia law also calls for something called the jizya, an extra tax on Christians. That is the equivalent of mob protection money that they would use to beat up and kill Christians under Sharia law. So there's a lot of uh, propaganda on the left and even the right about, you know, Muslims, you know, in under Sharia law included love Christians, you know. I think the Prophet Muhammad fought in 79 total battles, and 78 of them were offensive. They started trying to take over Constantinople, the second most holy see in Christendom, uh, within 70 years of emerging from the Arabian deserts, and they eventually got it, uh, the Iberian Peninsula besides. So it's, it's a dominating religion, and that's precisely the caricature used by feminists even though they don't really like beating up on Islam, even though it is a genuinely dominating religion and it is a genuinely male dominating female in an unholy, you know, sacrilegious way. Religion. It is the religion of pieces, not the religion of peace. And so feminists will characterize um, the Christian teaching of the duty of husbands and the duty of wives in much the same way uh, that, that, if they're being honest, they ought to be characterizing the duties of husbands and wives in Islam. And it, it just couldn't be any more false. The, the feminists are liars. A uh, husband is called to submit to a woman, to his woman, his wife, in one way. She's called to submit to him in, in all ways, aside from grave matter. His one way is his life is forfeit. If you're on the Titanic and you hit a... Uh, an iceberg, it's a foregone conclusion. You are a crumb of a man if you do not do your duty and let your wife get on that lifeboat and you're, you know, give her a kiss and say, I'll see you in paradise if we both get there. That's mm -hmm. a hell of a thing to be riddled with. And yet every good man does it. It's the vow that he takes at his wedding oath. And that's his duty. St. Paul talks about it. The Roman Catechism talks about it, and um, the first Christian interpreters, the patristics, talk about it. The duties of a wife, you know, so he's called to love her as Christ loved the church, meaning sacrifice his life for her. A wife is called to submit to him in all things, aside from grave sin. because There must be one sovereign in a polity or in a household, and it, it, it must be the male because this holy matrimony represents our vision of Christology. The wife submits in all other things. She's his helpmate, right? She, she, he kind of sets the goals and she helps him to reach them. And so yeah. he can say, hey, I, I don't need your help that way. I need it this way. And it's done in paternal love. And she does what she does in uh, wifely love. And yeah. it's beautiful. And it, it corresponds with what we call complementarity. Whereas yeah. Islam, they don't have a church. They don't have a Christ, right? They break crosses. And they truly have a, a, an actual model of spousal interrelations that is bullysome. Uh, men can m temporarily marry women that they want to have sex with. Right. They can, you know, they have the honor, co uh, you know, honor killings and genuine, uh, genuinely no limits on their power. They're, they're not delimited by mm. loving his wife the way that Christ loved the church, which is a huge delimitation. It means we go to hell if we don't love our wives so well. Yeah, they have to obey us and everything, but if we're abusive, then we go to hell, just as women ruin their relationships if they're married with their husbands by not obeying their husband. They, yeah. That's disobeying Christ. Well, that's nothing like Islam. Islam is the perfect opposite. The husband has unchecked power, and there is no Christology to speak of, and the wives are truly subservient. And it, it's, it's a really rough situation for them. I, I really feel for, for um, Muslim wives. Yeah. Man, thanks for making that distinction. I mean, definitely, even though our government has vacated Afghanistan, nation building didn't work out, um, there, there's still work to do there as Christians. I mean, there, there's the kingdom of God that still needs to, and Jesus Christ who needs to be um, shared there because he is the solution. And we're speaking with, Timothy J. Gordon, who offers, speaking of solutions, his book, Case for Patriarchy, who you can order now. You can get it at Sophia Press Institute. Great book. Recommending it. Like I said, if you are a member of my Patreon team, my book club, you'll get this book for free. Speaking with him here, talk about some current issues. 
And speaking about the the paternal aspect of a man, a man had so Timothy, you have I think it was six children, correct? Yes, sir. If one of your children became sick, um, and they came to your house, would you let your child in? Yes, I would, David. Would they need a passport or some sort of um search some sort of document to enter? <laughs> no. So why is the Vatican requiring that for people who has SARS, this uh, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, we're calling uh, a branch of the COVID tree? Why, why? Why? And we have we don't have a lot of time left. Like we got about so it's fifty five. We got about two minutes left. Give me your skinny on why would a dad, a father, requires children to show show that they're well to come into his house? Well. I have on my podcast said, well, this is not a, a, a papa acting like a loving father, but more like an abusive stepfather. And mm. an abusive stepfather might do something like that. That doesn't mean he's not Pope. I'm not saying that. I wouldn't say that. I'm just saying um, the Council of Trent, David, tells us that we are to obey even wicked pastors, mm. even wicked prelates, even wicked popes. So the Council of Trent means that we can cognize which is partly like saying we can recognize that there is such a, a papa who would be wicked. We still have to obey their ecclesiastical demands. They can't tell us what kind of car to drive, but we have to obey their ecclesiastical demands, even though they're tyrannical or semi-tyrannical. This is one of them, right? That we can't go home, cross the Tiber. Uh, you know, we, we can be east of the Tiber, I guess, in Rome, but we can't go to the good part of Rome in Vatican City without a, a passport. And there are other tyrannical decisions coming down the pike besides, like the motu proprio of mm -hmm. mid of July the 16th uh, was also another tyrannical diktat from Rome. So, and there have been lots from this Pope and it happens from time to time. I think it's a little more tyrannical than it's ever been. I'm a church history teacher um, at, at Retrograde Academy. You can also take church history. And I'll tell you this <laughs> much. Nice plug. I think, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I think this is more dictatorial than we've gotten, but I agree with your assessment. This is not fatherly or paternal. Yeah, Timothy J. Gordon, thanks for coming on the David L. Gray Show. Man, always a pleasure talking to you. Anytime, every time we get together, it's a good conversation. So make sure you get out there, get his book, go to Sophia Press Institute, anywhere you buy books online, check him out. And he is at timothyjgordon.com. Check him out there. Thanks for coming on, Timothy. Thanks so much, David. God bless you. And thank you for tuning in. I'll be back same time next week, same place. I look forward to conversing with you again. In between time, in the meantime, you can visit me at davidlgray.info. But until then, and until next time, remember that Jesus loves you. Jesus is there for you. And live your life like salvation matters. And may an abundance of the Lord's blessings and graces fall upon you and yours. Thank you.